professional wrestling's ability to mix real life drama with storyline fiction is something that's always fascinated me. When word leaked of a backstage brawl between Booker T and Batista during the 2006 SummerSlam commercial shoot, that obviously increased fan interest in a match between the two, and the feud that followed was a no-brainer. The same could be said for the recent Kofi Kingston-Randy Orton feud, which was based on Orton killing Kofi's main event push back in 2010 over a botched spot. But these are examples of real life animosity being used to further storyline rivalries. What about when a wrestler's personal life is made part of the show? Michael, I get it, I get it. Somebody told you that I had a bottle of Jack Daniels and an eight ball down here, didn't they? In 2007, Carlito had developed a bad stage reputation with WWE management for having a poor work ethic and taking it easy during house shows. Subsequently, he was placed into a program with Ric Flair and buried on national television for having a bad attitude in a promo that was based on actual WWE agent reports. You're a lazy, underachieving, Son of a bitch. But I guess it was better than in 2005 when Flair was arrested for attacking a fellow driver during a fit of road rage and the incident was reenacted by Edge the next week on Raw. Worse yet is when a company exploits a real life event to try and get a heel over and ends up taking the heat themselves. In an interview on Talk is Jericho conducted shortly after his departure from the company, John Moxley claimed that he was scripted to make a remark about Roman Reigns' then recent cancer diagnosis that was so offensive that he flat out refused to say it, feeling that the comment would have lost WWE sponsors and permanently harmed his reputation. He did, however, agree to make a less controversial statement in another promo, which was predictably condemned by pretty much everyone. But the WWE is far from the only wrestling company to ever try and capitalize on misfortune. In late 1998, Scott Hall's life was spiraling out of control due to drug and alcohol abuse. While this behavior would have almost certainly been a detriment to any other career, and to be fair, it later was in wrestling as well, in the cutthroat environment of the Monday Night Wars, WCW saw Hall's troubled personal life as an opportunity, and his character was briefly repackaged as an obnoxious drunkard in a storyline that has been harshly criticized ever since. This is a story Story of Scott Hall's month-long bender on WCW television. Thanks to numerous documentaries, TMZ articles, and embarrassing YouTube videos, Scott Hall is probably better known to the general public nowadays for his battles with addiction rather than his wrestling career. But despite never holding a world title, Hall was one of the biggest stars of the 90s. His jump to WCW on the May 27, 1996 episode of Nitro is probably one of the most historically significant events in professional wrestling history. It started the famous NWO invasion angle, which along with WWE Attitude Era booking briefly returned wrestling to mainstream popular culture. Despite his personal demons, Hall was a solid wrestler with a charismatic personality that was irreplaceable. Literally. Scott Hall claims to have generally abstained from drugs and alcohol until his late 20s, when he joined the AWA and began hanging around Kurt Hennig, who was known for being a hard partier and tragically died of a cocaine overdose at the age of 44. Over the next decade, Hall's drug use increased, with Scott abusing alcohol, cocaine, opium, and all manner of prescription medication. By the late 90s, this lifestyle had begun to take its toll, and he took a leave of absence from WCW in the spring of 1997 on his own volition in order to attend rehab, and what was reported to be in an effort to save his failing marriage. WCW even acknowledged his absence on screen. People are wondering where Scott Hall is. Scott Hall's taking care of business more important than professional wrestling right now. But that didn't stop them from continuing to falsely advertise that he'd be appearing at the Spring Stampede pay-per-view right up until the show went on the air. Ultimately, Scott was unable to maintain sobriety or save his marriage, and after the death of his protege, Louis Piccoli, in February of 98 due to a drug overdose, Hall returned to rehab. In later interviews, Scott has admitted that the stress of his divorce and the custody battle that followed led to an increase in his drinking during this time, and there were rumors that he and Nash were intoxicated when they came out for a promo on the March 16, 1998 episode of Nitro. During Scott's absence, tensions within the NWO resulted in the group splitting into two factions. At Slamboree 98, Hall returned to Wolfpack colors to defend his WCW tag titles with his partner Nash. The group, known as the Outsiders, had remained the tag champs throughout Hall's absence. In the finish to the match, Hall betrayed Nash, revealing himself to have aligned with NWO Hollywood, which dissolved the team and their on-screen friendship. Shortly thereafter, Hall took another short leave of absence from WCW, reportedly for another trip to rehab. He returned to television that July and was arrested later that same month in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for drunkenly groping a 56-year-old woman in a hotel parking lot. Hall allegedly approached the woman's car and grabbed her breast through the window 
window before placing her hand on his crotch. In the issue of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter published after the incident, Dave Meltzer described Hall as exhibiting a scary pattern of behavior and demonstrating the same warning signals that were present before the untimely deaths of wrestlers Brian Pillman and Louis Spatoli. He also mentioned that WCW planned to ignore the arrest. And sure enough, Hall wrestled in the main event of Monday Night Nitro just five days later. However, after the next week's thunder, he disappeared again for about a month. As Hall's arrest had made the papers and rumors of his drug issues and rehab stays were being discussed online, Eric Bischoff began to formulate an idea. Why not portray Hall as a drunk on TV? What better way to fool all the dirt sheet reading marks? Under Bischoff's leadership, WCW had had a lot of success with controversial work shoot angles. In fact, Scott Hall's original WCW debut had been presented as if he was a WWF wrestler legitimately crashing a Nitro taping. In a later interview, Hall claimed that he disliked the idea of working a drunk gimmick, but was willing to go along with just about anything as long as he kept getting paid. Hall was signed to a seven-figure deal, which included a favored nation clause, meaning that, for instance, when WCW signed Bret Hart to an even bigger deal in 1997, Hall automatically got a pay raise. Scott Hall's bender began on the September 10th, 1998 episode of Thunder, where Commissioner J.J. Dillon cut a promo addressing his absence, stating that to his knowledge, Scott Hall had spent the last month playing golf and lounging around the pool. He announced that Scott Hall would face Conan at that Sunday's Fall Brawl pay-per-view. Scott's last appearance on WCW television had seen him pick up a win against Conan on Thunder. Later that night, Hall interfered in the main event, attacking Kevin Nash during his match against Stevie Ray. Although he was able to easily knock Nash unconscious, Hall looked a little disoriented and seemed to be having trouble keeping his balance. On his way backstage, he nearly walked into a wall and also started drinking something as soon as he passed the curtain. That Sunday during Fall Brawl, Conan gave an interview to WCW.com stating that he knew Scott Hall was going through problems in his personal life and that he still had love for the guy, but he needed to leave the drama at the crib. Hall happened to be within earshot and confronted Conan, claiming that what he did on his time was his business as he stood drinking a cocktail at work. The segment ended with the drink being thrown in Conan's face after he admonished Hall for his lack of professionalism. The two squared off about a half hour later and Scott's condition had gone considerably downhill. He stumbled to the ring, the Ron ring actually, looking as if he'd been up for days and taking sips of his drink. The commentators noted that Hall was dealing with some personal issues and in no condition to perform. Always the optimist, on commentary, Tony Schiavone suggested that a big time athlete like Scott Hall would find a way to rise to the occasion. From the onset, this prediction appeared false, as Hall was in no state of mind to wrestle, and even his attempts to cheat were ineffective. Frustrated, Scott retreated to the outside for some refreshment, nearly leading to a merciful loss by countout. But the match continued, and Hall actually managed to mount a respectable offense, even pausing to wet his beak while in the middle of a hold. In fact, Scott nearly had the match won after a bat suplex from the middle rope, but he delayed executing his finisher in favor of another drink, which allowed Conan to recover and pick up the victory with the aptly named Tequila Sunrise. On commentary, Mike Tanay questioned whether Hall had meant to tap out or was just trying to order another round. The match at Fall Brawl was awarded zero stars by Dave Meltzer and The Observer, which was sadly only a little below average compared to the rest of the pay-per-view. While sending out a wrestler to act intoxicated surely didn't lend credibility to the promotion in the eyes of whatever casual fans were watching this debacle. WCW neglected to have Scott Hall and the Giant drop their tag titles before beginning this storyline, so they were also presenting this bumbling drunk as one of the best wrestlers the company had to offer. Not that they had much to worry about, as the WWE had been running their own drunk wrestler storyline for months. Road Warrior Hawk, who much like Scott Hall was in the middle of his own real life downward spiral due to drugs and booze, was repackaged as a suicidal alcoholic in a storyline where Draws was revealed to have been enabling his addictions in order to kill him and take his place in the Legion of Doom. After seeing how that worked out for John Heidenreich, perhaps he should have focused his efforts elsewhere. I guess I should also mention the 96 feud between the King and Jake Roberts, where Roberts, whose drug and alcohol dependencies have been extremely well documented, was working a gimmick as a teetotaling Bible thumper who was relentlessly tormented about his past by Jerry Lawler, who actually is a teetotaler. But at least in that case, when Roberts came to the ring appearing to be drunk, Commissioner Gorilla Monsoon came out to stop the match. If only he'd have been present during Heroes of Wrestling. Hall kept the party going the next night on Nitro during his match with Let's Looter, with Vincent bringing a paper bad rap bottle to the 
serene that probably wasn't a Gatorade. Hall seemed to have trouble even walking straight and at one point took a bump during a lockup before retreating to the outside to sip some booze. In the corner, Lex screamed at Hall that he was going to get somebody hurt. Enough was enough and Eric Bischoff made his way out to the ring to stop the match with Conan and Kevin Nash not far behind. Although Nash and Hall were in rival factions, Nash approached Hall like a concerned friend while Scott streamed, where were you when my life was falling apart? Hall refused to return backstage and berated everyone before vomiting all over Bischoff. I wonder if he had deja vu when this situation played out for real at Victory Road 2011. It should go without saying, but that wasn't real puke. According to Hall, it was cream of mushroom soup, which he used because that's what he heard they used when they made the exorcist. Hall also claims that he couldn't work with a belly full of booze, and although he was drinking heavily after every show, sometimes as soon as he walked backstage, he was never actually drunk during any of these segments. Once again completely wasted, Hall team was Stevie Ray on that week's thunder to take on Conan and Nash. From the apron, Kevin Nash looked on in disgust as Hall stumbled around the ring embarrassing himself. But after a coffee break, as Shafani referred to it, Hall came back to life, nearly executing the outsider's edge before a face plant into the mat left him falling out of the ring for a count out. WCW decided to dial it up the next week on Nitro, which opened with Scott Hall arriving to the building absolutely hammered, holding a sack full of clanking bottles and yelling in slurred speech to a security guard that someone had wrecked his car Go out in the parking lot. Somebody's wrecked my car. Get out there and do your job. While I have to admit, I appreciate this sort of dark humor, this skit unfortunately wasn't that far from the truth. Scott Hall wrecked five rental cars in 1998. He wrecked three of them in one month, and two in the span of 24 hours. Two months after this was filmed, Hall fell asleep while driving and flipped his car three times. Scott was scheduled to team with Stevie Ray to take on Nash and a goatee sporting Lex Luger in the main event, but he drunkenly staggered out during a random mid-card match instead and had to be restrained by Dusty Rhodes. You're gonna throw away your whole life, your whole career, everything, what's wrong with you? Due to Hall's condition, the Giant took his place in the tag match at the end of the night, but Hall trashed the announcer's booth totally inebriated and asking why they wouldn't let him wrestle, as WCW had no alcohol policy. Scott joined the match and goaded Nash into entering the ring, but he was in no shape to perform him and was quickly disposed of. As his fellow NWO Hollywood members dragged him towards the back, Nash grabbed the mic and yelled, I've lost my best friend because I don't even know who you are anymore. I lost everything I ever had. Let me tell you something. A match between the two at Halloween Havoc was made official, and Scott staggered his way out to the announcer's booth on that week's Thunder to cut a short promo on Nash, telling him that he was mean when he drank, and lately he was drinking all the time. But oddly enough, Hall showed up to his match against Billy Kidman on the next week's Nitro looking pretty sober, as Vincent wouldn't allow him to drink. Although he ended up taking a break midway through the match to down a beer anyway, which nearly cost him the win. But at the end of the night, when NWO Hollywood had Kevin Nash cornered, Hall came to the ring, poured out his cocktail, and went to work battering Nash with some super stiff right hands. Conan and Let's Luger, who had wisely reconsidered his decision to grow a totee, ran in to make the save. I think the idea here was to reestablish Hall as a legitimate threat to Nash and give fans a reason to pay to see them wrestle, besides the train wreck of watching Kevin Nash beat the snot out of a falling down drunk. And and even though Hall had fallen back off the wagon by the next episode of Nitro, he still managed to easily take out two jobbers. But off screen, Hall's personal life continued to deteriorate as he was arrested outside a topless club in Orlando that Friday night for keying a limousine. WCW ignored this arrest and the angle continued. The October 5th edition of Nitro saw the Wolfpack go bar hopping in search of Scott Hall, who was MIA. Perhaps feeling that he hadn't given his new look the proper consideration it deserved, Lex Luger's goatee had returned. They finally found Scott at Les's tavern, and Nash and Hall brawled on the pool table before fighting into the men's room, where Nash left Hall unconscious in the toilet. I have to hand it to WCW. They couldn't have possibly found a crappier bar than this for Scott Hall to hang out in. The front window is broken, there's water stains on the ceiling, and the walls are made of OSB sheathing. If I hadn't seen them walk into a building, I would have assumed this was someone's unfinished basement. At this point, Dana Hall, Scott's ex-wife, posted an open letter to NWOcentral.com, trashing WCW for continuing to employ Scott and exploiting his very real problems as entertainment, calling the angle deplorable, disgusting, and inexcusable. WCW responded by booking Hall to spend the go-home episode of Nitro hanging out at a bar with a bunch of random women all night. He returned to the arena for a six-man tag main event against Conan, Nash, and Lex Luger, who after learning to better trust his instincts, decided the goatee was simply not for him. But this time, Scott wasn't the only one stumbling to the ring, as Kevin Nash showed up completely wasted and wearing an old-school outfit 
outsider shirt. The two even shared a toast, but it was a hoax as Nash was actually sober and used the ruse to blindside Hall. In a perfect example of the constant disorganization that seemed to plague WCW, the bell suddenly rang and the match ended for no discernible reason. Scott Hall made his way to the ring at Halloween Havoc holding what appeared to be a cup of straight vodka. But it wasn't for drinking, it was for blinding Nash. The match went to the outside right away with Hall beating Nash like an animal before choking him in the near unconsciousness with a camera cord and knocking him down in the aisle. As the trainer attended the Nash, Hall returned to the ring to cut a promo on his former friend. Against trainer Danny Young's advice, Nash returned to the ring for further punishment as Hall, often considered to have one of the greatest work punches in wrestling ever, repeatedly showed his stuff. After a body slam, Hall signaled for the outsider's edge, but Nash pushed him away, too familiar with his old partner's tricks to be put down that easily. Into the corner for some punches, and Nash seemed to welcome the abuse, offering no resistance and motioning the Hall to keep it coming. And that's exactly what Hall did. He even briefly paused to play a drum solo on Nash's skull, but Nash fought back with an Irish whip and a side slam, which led to a double KO spot, and both men fighting on their knees. Back to their feet, and Nash took the upper hand in the brawl. He attempted his jackknife power bomb, but Hall, also an expert on his former partner's moveset, quickly escaped to the outside. With both men having caught their breath and renewed their focus, they locked up, and Hall began working the arm before Nash laid him out with a big clothesline and some stomps, then went to work with some knees and elbows in the corner, while yelling for Hall to have another drink. Have another drink baby. Now in full control of the match, Nash continued to berate and assault his dazed opponent. Refusing to give up, but having very little fight left in him, Hall responded with weak blows that Nash simply shrugged off. Having proved his point, Nash pulled down his tank top and after once again mocking Hall, connected with a huge jackknife powerbomb. But he still wasn't done, asking the crowd if they wanted to see one more, which got a huge response from the strongly pro Wolfpack crowd. I think you'll have a double. But after hitting another huge powerbomb, Nash didn't go for the cover. Instead, he teabagged his lifeless opponent and then left the ring, resulting in Hall winning the match by countout in 14 minutes, 19 seconds. Dave Meltzer awarded the match at Halloween Havoc one star, writing that it was slow paced and had a lot of brawling and describing the finish as simply weird. While I can't defend this angle, the match itself told a logical story in my opinion. Paul was drunk and fueled by anger and booze, so he destroyed Nash in the beginning, but his binge drinking had left him in no state to wrestle and he faded as the match went on, unable to fend off the better conditioned Nash. As for the weird finish, that was explained by Nash in an interview with Mean Gene the next night on Nitro. The match wasn't about winning or losing. It was about Kevin Nash getting his best friend back by beating some sense into him. There were actually no pinfall attempts at all during the match. Nash's plan seemed to be partially successful as Hall showed up sober the next night and shook his hand, actually thanking him for helping him hit bottom. Of course, he and the Giant put Nash through a wall only seconds later, ensuring the Hollywood vs. Wolfpack feud would keep going. But at least Hall was back on the wagon. This storyline is consistently ranked as among the worst WCW ever produced, which really says something as this was a company who once booked their number one one contender to spend an entire show stuck in traffic and unable to find the arena. Come to the parkway and you turn up the parkway. I can't hear you guys. I'm going to pull over the... and ask for directions. According to Hall, the angle ended due to pressure from an offended executive at Turner Broadcasting. On his podcast, Eric Bischoff apologized for booking this angle, calling the storyline one of the very few regrets of his career in the wrestling business. I think it goes without saying that no mainstream wrestling promotion is likely to do something like this nowadays. The WWE actually went as far as to ask Scott Hall not to enter the ring during Stone Cold's beer bash at the recent Raw reunion show. But this angle played out in 1998. Basically anything was on the table back then. Writing about the storyline in the October 19th, 1998 issue of The Observer, Dave Meltzer called the industry a business without heart or conscience. At the time this angle was playing out, most fans were still in the dark about the high prevalence of drug use in the wrestling business. About two months after this angle ended, USA Today ran an interview with Dana Hall where she discussed the rampant drug use in the industry and Scott's in particular. WCW gave a quote to the paper claiming that Hall had behaved professionally since his return from rehab and that he had a right to make a living. In The Observer, Meltzer speculated that the industry was one high-profile death away from a major scandal. The WWE had instituted a pretty strict drug testing policy in the early 90s, but it was abandoned by the Attitude Era due to cost concerns. But following the death of Eddie Guerrero in 2005 from a heart attack at 38 years old, and the public soma overdose of Nick Dinsmore a few days later, WWE instituted a wellness policy that's been in effect ever since. And since 2007, the company has offered free drug rehab to all former wrestlers. Whatever drug testing policy 
WCW had was selectively enforced and ineffective. Chris Jericho claims to have once failed a WCW drug test due to using a then lethal supplement. As a result, he was forced to spend an afternoon watching decades old anti-drug PSAs. But it should be noted that Eric Bischoff claims that WCW paid for Hall's first two rehab stays. And there were also reports that he addressed the locker room following Spicoli's death, offering to get help for anyone who needed it and promising that coming forward wouldn't negatively impact anyone's position with the company. Scott Hall managed to keep his job throughout 1999, despite multiple occurrences of showing up to Nitro tapings intoxicated and a pretty bizarre incident in March of that year where he fell down drunk in a parking lot and was accidentally run over by a car. Scott went on a major bender during WCW's European tour in February of 2000 and ended up having a physical altercation with his then girlfriend, Emily Sherman, who was the niece of Brad Siegel, the president of Turner Broadcasting. The next morning, the couple continued to fight at the airport and were denied boarding, causing Scott to miss Nitro, which was a pretty big deal as he was scheduled to main event that Sunday's pay-per-view. He reportedly showed up to Thunder on Tuesday and picked a fight with Terry Taylor, threatening to shoot on him in the ring, which caused the taping to be delayed over 30 minutes, as the opening segment that was supposed to feature the two had to be rewritten with Jarrett taking Hall's place. Scott Hall reportedly spent the night drinking at the bar across the street. This was the last straw, and Scott was sent home after Super Brawl that Sunday, never to return to WCW. However, he continued to draw a paycheck until October of that year according to this internal WCW memo. He worked a couple of untelevised ECW shows that November and there were talks of additional appearances but a DUI arrest on November 22nd where Scott drove into oncoming traffic and caused a three car crash ended those plans. He was arrested a week later for kicking in the door of a cab over a payment dispute. Paul returned to the WWE in February of 2002 as part of the NWO invasion. Despite taking anti-abuse, a prescription drug that makes you violently ill if you consume alcohol, the demon reared its ugly head and he was released following the infamous plane ride from hell. From there he had some stints in TNA which generally also ended due to his alcohol abuse and legal issues. After multiple attempts at rehab, Scott was invited to move in with close friend Diamond Dallas Page in order to get sober and try and rebuild his life. This period was captured in the documentary The Resurrection of Jake the Snake which is available on Hulu. Scott's been reported to have made a lot of progress since then and although the guy seems to have had some ups and downs, hopefully he's doing well. Thanks for watching.